the the word that jumps out to me in that question is that there is solution. It's hard to see spending billions of dollars from a public system into the pockets of private businesses as a solution for anything. <laughs> I mean, definitely during the peak of COVID, I think they were valuable because, you know, we we had such need for, for staffing. I think what's concerning is that four years later, or even two years later, we're still seeing a rise. And I think that's what's the concern. If the numbers were going down across the country, it'd be slightly different that, yes, they are, you know, finding their way out of this, but the numbers are still going up. Welcome to Perspectives, a Canadian journal of political economy and social democracy. I'm Clement Nokos, editor of Perspectives Journal and director of policy at the Broadbent Institute. Across Canada, hospitals, long-term care homes, and other health and care institutions are facing a workforce crisis. Care workers are overworked and underpaid. Emergency rooms and clinics are understaffed, and patients are suffering longer wait times while costs still balloon despite the cuts. According to a new report by the Canadian Federation of Nurses Unions entitled Opening the Black Box, Unpacking the Use of Nursing Agencies in Canada, in the throes of this staffing crisis, the use of for-profit agencies has skyrocketed. These agencies are for-profit nursing staffing companies that provide what are commonly referred to in Canada as travel, temporary, or agency nurses. The agency hires the nurse, contracts them out to healthcare facilities on a temporary basis, and the agency is paid based on the terms of the contract and fronts as the middleman to pay the nurse. Meanwhile, agency nurses are supervised and work under the healthcare facility. Since the pandemic, when healthcare workers were left on overdrive through the height of the global health crisis, more and more money has been spent on agencies, ballooning six times the money spent over four years from $250 million in 2020 to $1.5 billion in 2024 across Canada. CFNU President Linda Silas says this is clearly unsustainable. We cannot continue to slap a Band-Aid on a gaping wound. For more on this, I'm speaking with Dr. Joan Almost, professor of nursing at Queen's University who authored this report for the CFNU. Professor Almost, welcome to the Perspectives Journal podcast. Thank you for inviting me. So we're clearly in the midst of a nursing shortage crisis. Healthcare facilities like hospitals and long-term care homes are understaffed. Staff are overworked, underpaid, quitting or burning out in massive numbers. And to some, nursing agencies might actually be a solution. Why not pay for more nurses if they're needed? Nursing agencies also pay more and agency nurses often experience better working conditions. They seem like a solution and public health care institutions are spending so much on them to fill in the gaps. But why does your research say otherwise? Well, I think the, the, the word that jumps out to me in that question is that there is solution. It's hard to see spending billions of dollars from a public system into the pockets of private businesses as a solution for anything. <laughs> I mean, definitely during the peak of COVID, I think they they were valuable because, you know, we, we had such need for, for staffing. I think what's concerning is that, you know, it's hard to know when the peak of COVID actually was, but four years later, or even two years later, we're still seeing a rise. And I think that's what's the concern. If the numbers were going down across the country, it'd be slightly different that, yes, they are, you know, finding their way out of this, but the numbers are still going up. I just saw a CBC news story about uh, Nova Scotia, that their government just reported that they have spent already $100, $100 million on, on travel nurses, um, and they're tw almost $20 million over their budget. You know, it's not going away. And some organizations have been able to stop using them, and, and, and kudos to them. And others are trying. It's not that, that people really aren't trying. I think What's concerning is that the governments in some provinces, not all, some provinces are doing a fair bit, don't seem to be concerned about this and, and are telling us that it's actually going away. So I think, you know, seeing this as a solution when I, there's other solutions out there, I agree there needs to be an alternative for organizations to turn to. That's how it, you know private agencies came to the forefront is because that was only option they had. Some provinces now have put into place, such as Manitoba and BC, provincial agencies that are under the government department. So they're actually under the public system. So nurses still have the same option. Obviously, you know, the public system's never going to be able to pay nurses what agencies pay for them because they're making a profit off of them. 
we're not making a profit. But these nurses that are working in these provincial agencies within the government funding do make more money. Some make $25 more an hour. They do have the chance to travel. They do have the chance to have their accommodations paid for while they're traveling, per diems, travel costs, all those things that are part of the agency are now under the public system. And they also get to have benefits. So they get to have pensions, they get to have medical benefits and so forth, plus also benefits of of professional development within the health authority that they're part of. So there are alternatives that are being developed in some provinces. Other provinces don't seem to have shown a lot of interest in doing that yet. Hopefully this report will prompt them to to do that. And then Nova Scotia, you know, like I said, that the article I was just reading in the CBC News was that's what Nova Scotia is considering doing is starting a provincial agency as well. So I see them more as a band-aid that have been in place for several years, even before COVID. Agencies are not new. They've been around for decades helping with staffing in rural and remote areas, but they seem to be smaller in numbers and the cost didn't seem to be so high. It's been an entrepreneur's dream with COVID, with these agencies being able to now charge almost whatever they want because a lot of provinces don't provide oversight of the contracts and they're making a good chunk of money. Now, speaking of that money that we have to follow, the title of your new report is called Opening the Black Box, Unpacking the Use of Nursing Agencies in Canada. And you also write that publicly available data revealing the extent of agency use was practically non-existent, allowing them to operate unseen. This implies a lot of invisibility. You could go to a hospital, or long-term care center. And I don't think there's anything to indicate whether the staff that you encounter there are from an agency or not. Just how opaque then is, is the nursing agency industry and what else don't we know? Well, that's a great question. And and I think, you know, see if you came up with the title for the report, and I think it, it's perfect because it was like opening a black box because it really shows the lack of transparency about private agencies across Canada. You know, if we hadn't had a lot of media reports over the last few years, we wouldn't even know about agencies, the concerns, except for people, nurses reporting the concerns to organizations like the Canadian Federation of Nurses Unions or Canadian Nurses Association or or other groups. But the media has really been great at at showing the issue and they've had a hard time obtaining data. A lot of it's been through access to information requests. And I think even that has been challenging. And really, you know, the lid blew off, I think, with making people realize the high costs with the Global Mail article that was out earlier this year or last year that looked at uh, new Finland and New Brunswick and really showed how some agencies are taking significant advantage of what they're charging. This study, we had a lot of challenges obtaining data um, for various reasons. So we, you know, we did a review of literature, published literature reports, and only found one near the end of the process that was published in Ontario. You know, we tried to obtain from nurse regulators across the country how many nurses were working with agencies based on their registration database, and all of them except for one didn't have any data on them. So then we went to CAIHI to, to obtain that information. And they had the number of nurses working with agencies, but the numbers seem low compared to what we're being told from different healthcare facilities of the numbers that they have. So it didn't quite seem to make sense. So I think there's concern there about how the data is being collected by regulators. It's, it's like we're, we're not asking the right questions of nurses when they register. And then I collected data. We did a survey with chief nurse executives to try to you know, find out from their organizations what they were spending. We sent out about 141 surveys. We had about 31 responses, so not overwhelming. And of those 31, 15 reported not using ever using agencies. So really we ended up with 16 of those numbers. So then we went next to try and we submitted access to information requests to the health authorities that hadn't responded. So we did 19 of those sent out and had responses from 11. Two indicated they didn't have any data. And then two wanted very high cost of of being paid to, to do it because of the time required. So again, we got a small number. Some organizations really wanted to provide us with their data and they were challenged because of their system. The data was recorded in multiple places. It wasn't always divided up the way we wanted it divided up. So it would be for all nurses versus different types of nurses. And so they could only give us like one number for the last four years, basically what they're currently using. Part of it is data systems within organizations. But beyond that, we had a a hard time, like government sources weren't available. They, They don't share 
share that information. And, you know, the access to information request, there were some that never responded. And there's, you know, they're supposed to be mandated that they respond to these requests. And, and maybe they will in a couple of years. But, you know, it's concerning that it wasn't more transparent of what was out there, even when organizations wanted to be able to share it. There does seem to be a lot of secrecy around it. And I think a good example is in our survey that we did with nurses that work with agencies, we asked them if they would, you know, list the names of the agencies they provided. Many didn't want to list the name. And and I've heard that some have in their contracts, they actually have a confidentiality agreement where they aren't allowed to share any information about their contract with other sources. So I don't know if all of them are like that, but I've heard that some contracts do have that stipulation. Just like some contracts also have that nurses that sign on with their agency as a, under contract can't come back and work in the public system in that province for anywhere from six months to two years. So even if a nurse wanted to stay in a province, they can't stay there because of their contract. So the, the title, is, you know, Opening the Black Box, really is about that lack of transparency, the lack of being able to obtain information and trying to find what is the actual problem. And you're right, what data don't we know? I mean, we asked a lot of information. We were able to obtain a lot of different data from multiple sources. But there's some jurisdictions, we weren't able to obtain anything besides media reports about what was going on in that province. That's a bit concerning when you know there's data out there because you read about it later, or even the organizations that told us they didn't have data, I'd find another source later that showed us the data that they had provided to somebody else. It's about how the questions asked, I get, I've learned, but it's also concerning that they didn't seem to want to share. There was a lot of secrecy about it. I mean, despite those challenges in finding that information, your research still reveals the staggering costs being paid out to private nursing agencies. Public health care facilities like hospitals paid out $1.5 billion dollars in 2023-24, and that's just from the available data you can find. In your report, you also point to $3.2 billion in federal contracts signed with agencies between 2019 and 2024. As you mentioned, this isn't new, and you point out that public health care facilities paid around $248 million during the height of the pandemic from 2020 to 2021, but this has skyrocketed sixfold. Just how did these costs explode in just four years? You know, I think it's multifaceted. Some of it is that obviously the need is there. Vacancy rates of nurses across Canada was already rising even before 2020. And then in 2019, 2020, it just jump significantly like and that's that was just you know before the pandemic hit and then with the pandemic, it just continued to rise. I think it's, it's now become more steady. And then some provinces are saying it's now actually decreasing. I think nurses, for a lot of reasons, you know, nurses decided they didn't want to work during COVID or they became sick and they couldn't work. And if they were close to retirement, they just decided that was enough. They were done. Some jurisdictions had put in place vaccine mandates. So nurses who didn't want to receive the vaccines for COVID couldn't work. But, you know, that's come up a fair bit, too, of why an increased number of nurses leaving was because of that mandate. Really? I think what's happened is nurses have just realized that they've had enough. And before they probably realized that, but didn't have an alternative of where to go to. And, you know, as I mentioned earlier, even though agencies have been around for a very long time, nurses weren't really drawn to that work as much as they are now because they don't receive benefits. They weren't always guaranteed hours. There wasn't a lot of positives about it, except for nurses that really wanted to travel. Whereas, again, COVID's really highlighted how good it can be and how much more money they can make. And so now they have a choice, just like employers have a choice. Nurses now have a choice that they didn't really see before. How many have actually moved into it? It's, again, it's hard to tell because we don't have accurate data on that. You know, in my study, 68% of nurses who identified that they work with agencies also identified that they still work with the public system. They have jobs still in both systems and, you know, and they're either continuing to do that or they're leaving one or the other. You know, it's ballooned because of the, the shortage has continued to be a problem. And also, you know, a lot of places aren't, especially during COVID, weren't really looking at retention strategies, right? Because they were, you know, putting out too many fires around the pandemic and the constantly changing information, they didn't have a chance to focus on how to retain nurses. Plus, nurses went off on sick leave. If they tested positive for COVID, they couldn't go to work because of the policies. So that, I think, was also a big part of it because, of course, nurses were testing positive a fair bit. Going back to, you know, my previous comment, what's concerning is, is that two years later is still rising and the hours of being required to work is still rising. The other area is, I think, agencies have also increased the costs. The idea, the comparison of the facilities that gave us the number of the costs that they were paying to agencies and also the number of hours they were required and divided them and the numbers rose 
from like $99 an hour in 2020, 21, up to around $140, $130 in 23, 24. That shows that how much agencies are charging has increased significantly. I think it was like 34%. And some employers, like we also did interviews with employers, talked about how they were challenged by that because they'd have to have lots of conversations about, they'd find out an agency was going to increase the cost again. And when do they decide enough is enough? When are they going to stop paying the extra cost? knowing that if they decide to do that, nurses will continue to be working short on the units. They won't get their vacations. They won't get time off or they'll have to close emergency departments or they'll have to shut down services. I think it's multifaceted about why it's gone up. I think this the nursing shortage has continued to go up and has plateaued. With that, you think again that the numbers are going to start going down, which they haven't, which in turn suggests that maybe the, the cost being charged by agencies continues to rise. Don't necessarily have that information because it was hard to actually find out how much they're charging because it ranges widely across agencies, across provinces, across areas and provinces. That's the piece that really still is, is a puzzle. And so- so this may be outside the scope of the study, but I know myself from my own family and community, there are many healthcare professionals that come to Canada with education in English and healthcare work experience in some of the most testing environments. There have been, you know, some efforts by a few governments to fast track newcomers to become nurses, but it's clearly not enough as many qualified healthcare workers still end up working in other non healthcare work, like participating in the live-in caregiver program, they come to Canada as international students, or come via other temporary foreign worker schemes. I even have a cousin who dropped her nursing career to take up a small private education business, teaching newcomer nurses not so much new techniques in nursing. They already been there, done that, but really how to jump through all the excessive hoops necessary to practice nursing in Canada, despite already jumping through all those other hoops to get to Canada in the first place. So should we be considering healthcare work-based immigration programs kind of like what Canada did in the mid-20th century to staff hospitals across the prairies? Should we revisit those kinds of programs in Canada today? Uh, yeah, and I think that that's, I mean, it's a great question. And, and I think it's, it's, you're right, it is outside the scope of, of, of the study. We didn't look at this aspect. And, and I, I don't, I'm not certainly not an expert in internationally educated nurses, but I, I do know it's been a challenge for all of them. First of all, to have their, their education programs assessed from their own country and figure out, you know, where are the gaps and what do they need to do and then go through that and then be able to obtain those competencies. And then to actually register with their, the regulatory body in, in the province where they want to work. You know, it's often a two or three or longer year program. And, and many of them do decide to stop it because it, it also costs a significant amount of money for each of those assessments. It's, it's obviously not free. And like it spent, you know, thousands of dollars to be able to do this. You know, certainly that again, during COVID, the, a lot of the government's mandated regulatory authorities like in Ontario, the College of Nurses of Ontario, to fast track them. So that was done. I assume it was rather effectively, but they, so the, the regulatory bodies are looking at that more closely. And certainly there's work being done about, you know, what do they actually need to assess and trying to find ways to, to maybe minimize the assessment. Because like you said, like sometimes if they've been educated in other countries, you know, their education program in their countries in English, they speak English, you know, why do they need the en English language requirement? Why do they need, you know, to, to prove this? So there is work being done in that, but it's still a very long process to go through. And a lot of them become very frustrated. I think the other side of that is we always have have to be cautious because there's a nursing shortage worldwide. And it's, it's great that nurses want to come to Canada from their own country. What's concerning is sometimes when governments go to a country and specifically recruit nurses to come to Canada, because then that puts that country at a disadvantage. I mean, because they're already short nurses as well, and they're leaving nurses. I don't know, maybe Canada pays more than they would make in, in their own country. I think it's kind of a double-edged sword sometimes of, yes, there's, there's nurses that have moved here and are here that are great to get them into the system more effectively and have them working versus actually going to other countries and actively recruiting nurses from that country at a time when there's so many shortages elsewhere. And I mean, other countries are worse off than Canada is even, which is hard to believe. And so each country is supposed to sign kind of a, a code of conduct to not do that. But I do know there's been provinces in Canada that have actually gone to like the Philippines and India and, and other areas to specifically recruit, which is very challenging because then those nurses are gone and that country's you know shortage is even worse. So I agree, we need to find a way to do it better. And I do know there's been a lot done in Ontario over the last uh, few years. 
to try to do that. Again, not sure how effective it's been with all the changes, but there does seem to be work being done in this area to try to make it better. And so the bottom line is we still have ourselves a nursing shortage crisis, but we also understand that nursing agencies are just unsustainable. So how do we clamp down on nursing agencies? And what do governments and employers need to do to solve the nursing shortage crisis? We, so we list in the, in the report three recommendations that actually address that, those areas quite nicely. And the first one is we need to phase out private for-profit agencies. And, you know, we've had some pushback on that because as people say, well, how can you phase them out? We, it's not worth it, not suggesting to phase them out within a year because that's not going to work. We're going to put the system in chaos because we do still need them without a doubt. And we don't want to shut more services down or we, and we don't want to, you know, have nurses working in the hospital, working short all the time and not getting vacation. I mean, that's not reasonable. But what needs to be done is governments and employers need to develop strategies and our plan in place about how they are going to phase out and when they're going to do it over the next few years. Hard to say how long that will take. I think it depends on the size of the organization and how dependent they already are on agencies. But, you know, I think they need to sit down and have those conversations. And I think government needs to have employers be required to submit a plan on what they're going to do. The next part of, of phasing out is going back to what I talked about is employers need an alternative because, again, the nursing shortage isn't going to go away overnight either. Governments are increasing the number of students going to programs, which sort of helps, sort of doesn't because they don't always stay when they do graduate. And they, you know, recruiting inter internationally educated nurses as well. So there's been attempts to recruit. But we need to give an alternative where employers can go until we do all that. So that goes back to the example of the provincial agencies, like the Manitoba one and the BC one, right? Where the government will create an organization that oversees an agency under the public system funding, or the government does it themselves and creates this opportunity so that you know nurses can go into this agency, still have the flexibility, still have the bonuses over time and so forth. And employers have that to go to rather than going to a for-profit agency. So that's the first recommendation. The second one is about working immediately to develop strategies to, for the nursing shortage. Again, some provinces are doing this well, others not so much. But it's, you know, it's funding initiatives to do this and helping organizations find ways, give extra funding. You know, if we're willing to pay billions of dollars on agencies, why aren't we willing to pay some of that money away from agencies to focus on retention strategies? And that's the big piece. We need to retain nurses so that they aren't you know, leaving to wherever they're going. Health Canada put out a retention toolkit earlier this year that is full of evidence-informed strategies for organizations to use that's been well-received. A lot of ideas in there. And that was, was developed with nurses, for nurses. It wasn't just developed by, you know, someone within Health Canada. This was based on what nurses, employers, unions, you know, professional associations all suggested as strategies based on experiences. So there are toolkits out there. We need to find ways to help students. You know, we need to help them with their tuition. We need to help support them when they graduate. You know, more and more nurses at a younger age are leaving within the first two years because it's not the job they thought it was going to be, you know, because they get put into places where they're, you know, they're suddenly the charge nurse after, you know, a few shifts and or they're being asked to do things that they, you know, aren't comfortable with. And because senior nurses are retiring, they've lost that mentorship that's so important for the junior nurses. A lot needs to be done around each of the groups. And I think the place to start really is to listen to the nurses in your organization. They know what they want. And I think that's the big piece is governments mostly don't listen to nurses or they listen to them and they don't actually act on what they've listened to. You know, it's like having the voice of nurses and we need nurses at the table at, and, and nurses, when I say nurses at the table, I mean nurses that are actually at the bedside or in the community or in long-term care. Like we need those nurses having their voices at the tables to give ideas because they know what they need. This study, we asked the question to the nurses that work with agencies, you know, why are you working with agencies? And besides pay, you know, the biggest areas were flexibility. You know, they want to travel, they want opportunities and so forth. But all that comes down is having flexibility in their, their work life. They're tired of the rigid schedules that they have. They're tired of some rules that they have to follow around benefits and pensions and so forth. And they really want to have flexibility on how their work looks. I'm not sure if you've heard of self-scheduling. So there are some chance that nurses, you know, can actually self-schedule. And there's, a, there's still a process that goes through so that everyone has a fair chance at it. But 
that provides an opportunity for nurses to actually have control over their schedule versus you know being told they're going to work two days two nights four off over and over and over and over again and so there's lots of ways to, to work at this but it's not going to happen easily and it's not an easy process i mean we've been talking about retention of nurses for decades i mean and if we'd found that magic bottle it would be great but we haven't and you know the new generations they change every time they come in they aren't going to work the same way the generation before them worked or someone in my generation. They want flexibility. They want work-life balance. They want their vacation. They want to be able to travel. So it's finding ways to build that into our current system. Look at schedules. Look at the collective agreements. Look at all the rules, policies, and so forth around nurses and, and what can be changed and what can't be changed, I think is big. And then the third recommendation before all this happened, because this is all long-term ideas, is governments need to find ways to regulate and have oversight over the agencies. The Globe and Mail article that talked about the, the agencies out in, in Newfoundland and New Brunswick really showed there was no control over those contracts by anyone or the submission of expense forms for reimbursement. So the government needs to do that. In some provinces, agencies don't even have to register. So, I mean, I don't think the government even knows how many are, are in their province. Start with registering, start registering in their business, start with stipulating what they can and can't you know, charge. And again, some provinces, Manitoba and BC, they seem to be the ones that have done a fair bit, do have legislation that the agencies can't charge more as a base rate than what they've been stipulated in this legislation. So there's lots that they can look at their counterparts at what they're doing and find ways to do it. And I think that's where you know, we need to start bringing these costs down so that then we can put those savings into all the other strategies or the recommendations that have been suggested. But it needs to start now because it, it's, it's not going away. Professor Almos, thank you for joining me on the Perspectives Journal podcast. You're welcome. Thank you again for inviting me. I really enjoyed this. That was Dr. Joan Olmos, professor of nursing at Queen's University and author of the new report for the Canadian Federation of Nurses Unions entitled Opening the Black Box, Unpacking the Use of Nursing Agencies in Canada. You can read the full report by visiting nursesunions.ca and by finding the link in our show notes. And if you like this interview, share and subscribe to Perspectives, a Canadian journal of political economy and social democracy on all major podcast platforms, as well as Press Progress's Sources podcast that digs deeper into the news stories you won't find in the major papers. The Perspectives Journal podcast and sources are proud members of the Harbinger Media Network, Canada's progressive podcast community. You can read more in Perspectives Journal, a publication of the Broadbent Institute, by visiting perspectivesjournal.ca.